son of Pastor Fred Phelps of the Westboro Baptist Church, which gained infamy, infamy from the protests at soldiers' funerals around the United States. He's the sixth of 13 children and was taught his father's extreme version of Calvinism from an early age. This was accompanied by extreme physical punishments and abuse, extreme dietary and health requirements and other extreme expectations. Nate left home at midnight on his 18th birthday and moved to California where he built a new life away from his family. He later moved to Canada and only recently began speaking out about his story after a chance encounter with a reporter while driving a cab in Cranbrook, British Columbia. Nate has now spoken about his story to many groups around North America and even returned home to Topeka in 2010 to tell his story to the people in his hometown. Today, Nate lives in Calgary, Alberta, working for Center for Inquiry and serving on the board of Recovering from Religion. He's a vocal LGBT advocate and speaks out against the dangers of religion and child abuse. He's also a member of the SSA Speakers Bureau. His topic tonight is I Harm When I Prejudice. Please help me in welcoming Nate Phelps. I harm when I prejudge. I think that's what I wrote. And I prejudice doesn't make a lot of sense. So let's get this out of out of the way first. Uh, God hates the secular student alliance. So I remember when I was younger, I used to hear the phrase catechism. I always heard it uh, relating to the Catholic faith. I did a little research on it. I understand actually John Calvin wrote a catechism for uh, Calvinism. So I thought I would tr try my hand at it, uh, Westboro Baptist style, with editorial provided. Get started tonight. Okay, so Yahweh is God. Jesus is the son of Yahweh. So that means, and He's the son of God, but he is also God. So that means that he had, um, God had sex with the virgin and his mother at the same time. God created the world in six days, about six or 10,000 years ago. He populated the world with a, from a single couple, Adam and Eve, not Adam and Eve. Unless you look at Genesis 5, 2, where it says male and female created them and blessed them and called their name Adam. The day when they were created, so maybe it was Adam and Adam. And then he got mad and violated his own commandment by drowning the entire world except for one family and still he drowned them on the earth. And don't tell me that's not possible. God can do it because he's not. Then he, repop he repopulated the whole earth with one family, but only after he punished one of Noah's sons by making him black for two slave, for laughing at his own father. God is angry, he's vengeful, he's jealous. He shuns man's morality when he gets angry. I'm to do as I say, not as I dream in power. He destroys those who stand in his way. He chooses who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. And he hates all those that, that he has chosen to go to hell. Even though he's the one who chose to go to hell. God's choices are beyond human understanding. It seems to be the fallback for most religious ideas. But there are some clues in the Bible, in Calvin's Bible, in Fred's Bible. God hates fags. He hates fag enablers. He hates fornicators. He hates, hates adulterers. And he hates whoremongers. Seems to be always concerned with our sex organs and what we do with them. He also hates women who aren't in subjection to their husbands. And he really hates women who cut their hair. Yeah, that's. <laughs> the fact is that God hates women. He hates Yahweh. Hates women. So, how do you avoid this terrible hatred of God? Well, you have to be in attendance at the Westboro Baptist Church every Sunday. 
and you have to buy by, by every rule outlined by the pastor there without challenging it. And you have to mirror the hate that God expresses towards those that he's bound for hell. And you have to aggressively advocate for a Christian WBC style theocracy. So how does it come to happen that groups like my family exist out there today? Well, I'm not an expert, but I can tell you what I observed and concluded from that environment, at least some of the things I observed. Beliefs and actions are built on a hierarchy of assumptions. And where you find the first false assumption, all those that follow must be flawed. So let's look at some of their assumptions. They assume there's an absolute truth and moral standard in the world. Therefore, they assume there's an all-powerful deity who defines that standard for us in a book called the Bible. Therefore, they assume the Bible is the divinely inspired word of, of that all-powerful deity. Therefore, they assume someone has to be divinely inspired to interpret that word for them. Therefore, because Fred took that position, he wins the title. Therefore, he has absolute authority over everyone, even when they're adults. And therefore, they assume that, all, that their eternal destiny is wrapped up in whether they submit to Fred Felser's authority. The twisted parallel universe. There's uh, an author named John Chu that recently wrote an article about it. It's probably one of the best articles I've seen. He spent three or four days there at, at the church. And he concluded the article by talking about this almost uh, surreal, um, uneasy feeling that he came away from, the fact that these people could talk so intelligently, and yet they spoke a different language. He crafted a different world where love is hate and good is evil. They literally will tell you that, that they don't hate you. In fact, they're the only ones in the world who love you. That's what happens and paradigm shift and the meanings of words change. The system is impervious to reason or logic because it's not their reason and logic. So why should we care about that? The group have, has a hierarchy of assumptions that leads them to the conclusions that they flash all over their signs. But so what? Let them believe what they will. It does no harm. Or does it? Let's take a look at what, Pro, at what Westboro Baptist Church has done here. And in their form, I think we'll see what so many different religions and ideologies do in the world and how this might actually cause harm. One of the things that my father did was he assumed the motives of others. Most of our childhood, both behind the pulpit and uh, just living in that family, we were constantly hearing them talk about the motives, the imagination, the rationale behind people doing what they did out there in the real world. Politicians, why he made the decision. Oftentimes, he would link it to um, religious issues. Oftentimes, they were motivated by Satan. He would talk about uh, the demonic motivation for the spiritual instead of the judge who might have ruled against him. We will often talk about why the they chose the lifestyle that they chose, wanted their immorality to the world. And I remember in all of that, I was always wondering. He thought, I mean, he always talked about how, how good he was. That, that was one of the things that was interesting. And he saw himself as, um, and, and spoke often about how well he was crafting arguments. He called himself a wordsmith. But I always wondered how in the world he possibly could know spoke as though it was just absolute truth, that it was fact. But he really didn't know these people very well. And he showed up when he was involved in the physical violence towards his uh, wife and children as well. He used the same tactics while he was speaking us to talk about how he, he had satanic evil in his drink. And uh, I remember thinking at the time, often when he came up, maybe if I could just explain to him that he was completely off base, he was wrong. Stop that behavior. I realized only later that what he was doing was he was building up straw men so he could tear them down. He was prejudging. One of the other things he did was he operated on this creating an exclusive ideology. 
we crafted an us versus them environment that became a reality for everyone in that system. We created an exclusive place for the righteous. And in doing this, he was tapping into a basic human trait. It works because we crave exclusivity. We want to belong, we want to be special. When we define ourselves, we highlight those things in our world that make us special and exclusive. We want to belong to the exclusive clubs, the exclusive spas. We want to attain that ex exclusive degree, graduate with exclusive honors. But exclusive, by definition, excludes. With religion, it creates a twisted sense of reality and morality. And Fred's effort to define what good looks like in word and deed, he necessarily also had to define what did not fit into good and was therefore bad. He often focused, focused once again on, on the sexual issue, obsessed over him, and of course, whether a woman, a woman cut her hair. One of the things that I found fascinating about that are in, in my later years, and I actually noticed it when I was younger, is that he seemed to spend so much time on these swipes. I, talking about the, the hair color thing. I don't mean to pick on you, brother. But it was one of those things you had all of these really profound moral issues that, that you understood were out there. But it seemed to spend so much time on whether a woman had her hair covered, whether she was, uh, wore her hair long. These things that didn't seem to really make a whole lot of difference. Another example of that was when um, about uh, two years after he graduated from law school, he was suspended. Um, for an ethics violation, so he started sending us out to South Candy, to go out South Candy. We found out within the first year or so that there was, uh, you could make a lot of money uh, selling candy to people who had had a few drinks. So we were out selling candy on Friday nights and Saturday nights at the bars in uh, downtown Kansas City, a really bad area of town. Several times over the years, violence happened in one of the kids. So we'd be out there selling candy with strippers performing, you know, 15 feet away in the bars. And it's not the senior that I'm complaining about, you guys. It's again this whole issue of how you could make so much of these fairly insignificant moral questions and completely ignore what, to me, you know, when, once I had my own kids, I looked at and thought, Never in a million years would I put my kids anywhere near that kind of situation. And when he was called on it from time to time, he would go back to this kind of weird. You know, God is protecting him because he holds his hand over his children, kind of thing. So it creates this kind of dysfunctional, disconnected ideology about what the real world, world is really like. He also created this all or nothing type thinking. Again, back to striving to create this idea of, of what is good. By definition, you have to exclude that which is bad. And when you exclude it or define the entire out group is assumed to be absent any of the attributes of the good and carry all the attributes of the bad. It's one of those things that to me over the years I saw is extremely simplistic and intellectually lazy. We had exclusivity that required prejudgment. We had exclusivity and prejudgment. We had exclusion and prejudice. With the natural human behavior, I think Richard touched on this, we have this uh, tendency, our ancestors did, of seeing things that weren't really there, assessing danger quickly so that they could stay alive. These are the same behaviors that we use today to create this, this uh, tendency to exclude and to judge. These are also the behaviors that give us permission to fly planes into buildings. Because if we prejudge, we don't have to get to know the individuals in the group. If we prejudge, we can justify keeping our distance from them. If we prejudge, we can dehumanize the out group, making it easier to mistreat or destroy them. So back to my earlier question. What is the harm of ideas like this? God hates fags. This is the essence of my training during the 18 years that I grew up there. 
God hates. One of the biggest problems I had going up there was I heard this ideology that we were the unique ones, we were the chosen ones, we were the only ones on the earth today who were going to go to heaven. And as a child, I expected to see evidence of that in the form of maybe halos or something there that could point to us being truly unique. But instead, what I saw was the behavior that my father exhibited towards people that were turning around his life. And it became clear to me that there was something not right. But there was also all the teaching that was going on here. If we didn't believe what he taught us, if we didn't stay there, if we didn't do the things that he said, that we were going to, at some point, either suffer on this earth and or suffer for eternity after we died. So it wasn't as simple as just saying, I disagree with all of this. Um, I don't believe that what my father does to other humans is right, so I'm leaving. So when I left on my 18th birthday, I left with a lot of confusion, a lot of questions, and quite frankly, I left believing that when I turned 42, I was going to die and spend eternity in hell. 42 because he knew that Christ was going to return around the year 2000. I'm not sure how he knew that. The folks tell me that this is why I'm an atheist today, that I had the wrong idea of God when I was growing up at the West Grove Baptist Church. I've come to believe that these are the people who want everything to be perfect. But they can't see that it's fantasy. We had uh, John Loftus, and you folks might know him. He was up in uh, Calvary, did a talk to the Senator Inquiry. And then he did a uh, series of debates in uh, Calgary, Red Deer, and Edmonton, just basically just went straight north and just did a series of debates with the fellow who wrote God or Godless with. His name was Ramjo. Roger. One of the things I know, I went to the first debate there in Calgary the, the day after he gave the talk to CFI, and he was, what Randall does is he builds kind of a um, theoretical idea about what God should be. And so he talks in terms of this absolute morality or this absolute justice or this absolute truth, but he doesn't spend any time or effort trying to demonstrate exactly what that is. He can't tell you what that absolute truth is. It's almost as though if they can just make the claim that they, they get that ground and we're excluded from it. But when pressed, he couldn't do any better than anyone else in defining or defending the specifics of those claims. Yes, it's possible that if I had had a perfect childhood with loving parents teaching me about a loving God who watched over me after creating the universe and kept me and my family safe from harm, while the world around me reflected the consequences of a benevolent, all-loving God, and every child born was safe and secure and nourished by their own loving, caring parents, and there was no violence or crime, and we all gathered every night around the campfire and sang Kumbaya. You see what I mean, fantasy. I will concede that growing up at the Westboro Baptist Church gave me great motivation to pursue this issue, this whole question of religion, to a defensible conclusion. In that sense, growing up at the Westboro Baptist Church did make me an atheist today. Just as Dave Silverman likes to say, if you want to make an atheist, have him read the Bible from cover to cover. But it's intellectually lazy when people assume I just nonchalantly landed on atheism. Why did I land on atheism? What really did it was years and years of asking questions and reading. What did it was tearing down and rebuilding the ideas of my youth over and over again, and trying to make sense of the whole system every time I discovered an error and discarded an idea. What really did it was confronting and finally rejecting the stark terror that I was in a spiritual battle and was being duped by Satan. What really did it was trying on the kinder, gentler God of modern Christianity, only to discover that the essence of exclusion and prejudice are alive and well, disguised as John P. 16. What really did it was when I sat among my friends and family in Southern California and watched the buildings fall down in New York. When I reached out to Lisa Cross family, Lisa was a young girl who went to school with my oldest daughter in Rancho Santa Margarita, and she just recently graduated from Boston College and happened to be on that second plane that went into the World, the world Trade Center. And what did it for me was when I watched with horror the devastation 
brought by the group of men who knew that their faith was right and their God was going to reward them for their excluding and prejudicial actions. What really did it was when I watched the people of America respond to this violent act of blind faith by retreating to the false comfort of their own blind faith. And in that moment, I had an epiphany. Blind faith could very well be one of the greatest dangers we face today. Because with faith, there's no accountability. And with faith, if you invoke it yourself, you have no right to argue with someone else's. I've made that statement several times over the last year and a half, and to date, there have been no legitimate challenges to the statement. So let's look at this idea one more time. God hates bags. When I see that sign, the cornerstone message of their campaign for the last 22 years, I have to wonder. Consider that first word. There's no legitimate, demonstrative, measurable, predictable evidence that God is active in the, in the affairs of our world. So this sign, in fact, doesn't speak for anyone other than the person carrying it. So I would change that first word from God to I. And then what about hates? That's a verb, isn't it? Hate defines an emotion. And emotions too often lead to actions. And actions based on hate are almost always harmful. So I would change hates to do harm. And then finally we have the interesting word, bags. Seems like there's never a shortage of targets to hate. Long before God hated bags, he hated Jews and blacks and Protestants and Catholics and women and Muslims and Indians, Irish, Italians, Tommies, and on and on. These are just the latest group we practiced our, our exclusion and prejudice on. At present, our society is going through the painful process of holding up these two judgments and testing them in the harsh light of reason. And folks, the outcome is inevitable. So in the meantime, we continue to fight for that end, the end of true judgment. So I would change that last word, fags, to when I see judge. Voila. God hates fags becomes, I do harm when I prejudge. I should make a sign. So now who's the wordsmith? <laughs> so let me close with this final thought. One of my favorites. The British philosopher Bertrand Russell was interviewed late in his life. He was asked, what would you think it worth telling future generations about the life you've lived and the lessons you've learned from it? And his reply included these words. I should like to say two things, one intellectual and one moral. The intellectual thing I would want to say is this. When you're studying any matter or considering any philosophy, ask yourself only what are the facts and what is the truth that the facts bear out. Never let yourself be diverted either by what you would like to believe or what you think would have beneficial social effect if it were believed. But look only and solely at the facts. This is the intellectual thing that I should wish to say. The moral thing I should wish to say, I should say love is wise and hatred is foolish. Thank you all very much.